Hi, I'm Stephanie Vecchio of the Middle Country Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode in our History Bites series. Today, we will discuss the Black Sox scandal of 1919, where the Chicago White Sox were bribed by gamblers to throw the World Series that year. The architects of the Black Sox scandal have never been conclusively identified. Many believe that the plot was originally concocted by White Sox first baseman Chick Gandel and Boston bookmaker Joseph Sport Sullivan. Surviving grand jury testimony portrays Gandel and White Sox pitching staff ace Eddie Seacott as the primary instigators of the fix. In any event, the fix plot soon embraced many other actors, both in uniform and out. Indeed, this dissection of the scandal has long been complicated by its scope because there was not a single plot to rig the series, but actually two or more, each with its own peculiar cast of characters. Gamblers had long been greasing the palms of disgruntled underpaid ballplayers in exchange for inside tips, but attempting to rig an entire World Series was a rare and perhaps even unprecedented proposition. In June 1921, at the Black Sox trial, two years after the infamous series, Black Sox defense lawyers blamed the players' motivations for the series fix to the thriftiness of Chicago club owner Charles A. Comiskey. But the White Sox had the second highest bait payroll in the major leagues, with stalwarts like second baseman Eddie Collins, catcher Ray Schock, third baseman Buck Weaver, and pitcher Seacott being at or near the top of the pay scale for their positions. But the White Sox clubhouse was an unhealthy place, with the team long driven by faction. One click was headed by team captain Eddie Collins, Ivy League educated and self-assured to the point of arrogance. Aligned with Collins were Shock, spitballer Red Faber, and outfielder Shano Collins and Nemo Liebold. The other, a scrappier group united in envy, if not outright hatred, of the socially superior Collins, was headed by tough guy Gandal and the more amiable Seacott. Also in their corner were Weaver, shortstop and fix enforcer Swede Riesberg, outfielder Happy Felch, and utility man Fred McMullen. Gandal soon enlisted White Sox pitchers Eddie Seacott and Claude Lefty Williams, shortstop Charles Swede Riesberg, and outfielder Oscar Happy Flesh into the scheme. Third baseman Buck Weaver was in on the early stages of the plot before pulling out, and utility infielder Fred McMullen was cut in after he overheard the players talking about the deal. Power hitter, shoeless Joe Jackson, was also approached. Gandal's faction first began to discuss the feasibility of throwing the upcoming World Series during, during a train trip late in the regular season. Even before the White Sox clinched the 1919 pennant, Seacott started to feel out Bill Burns, a former American League pitcher turned gambler, about financing a series fix. According to Seacott, the Sox were envious of the $10,000 playoffs rumored to have been paid to certain members of the Chicago Cubs for dumping the 1918 series against the Boston Red Sox. The lure of a similar score was enhanced by the low prospect of discovery or punishment. As Gandal recruited conspirators on the team, Sullivan and a tangled web of crooks that may have included former Sox player Sleepy Bill Burns, former Detroit Tiger Bill Maharg, and boxer Abe Adel began raising the bribe money. New York mob leader Arnold Rothstein may have been a major player, but his involvement has never been proven, and evidence suggests that Gandal and his co-conspirators may have hatched multiple deals with different syndicates. They not only sold this series, Abe Adel later claimed, but they sold it wherever they could get a buck. Bookies had previously had the Sox winning the World Series over the underdog Cincinnati Reds by as much as 3-1. to one but the odds shifted after those in the know began betting heaps of cash on the Reds. As the championship drew near, the streets buzzed with rumors that several White Sox players were in the pocket of high-stakes gamblers. Suspicions that the championship was in the bag only increased after the White Sox and the Reds met on October 1st for the first game of what was then a best of nine World Series. After hitting a batter with one of his first pitches, supposedly a signal that the fix was on, pitcher Eddie Seacott went on to make a series of uncharacteristic blunders from the mound. Chicago lost the game 9-1, leading the New York Times to marvel, 
Never before in the history of America's biggest baseball spectacle has a pennant-winning club received such a disastrous drubbing in an opening game. The faulty play continued in Game 2, when Sox pitcher Lefty Williams gifted the Reds a 4-2 win after walking three batters in a row. The White Sox continued losing over the next few games, and by October 6th, the series stood at 4-1 in favor of the Reds. Everything was proceeding as planned, yet according to later accounts, many of the Crooked Sox players had begun to grow restless. They had purportedly arranged to receive their bribes in five $20,000 installments, one after each loss, but the gamblers had failed to deliver the full amount. After Game 5, the furious ballplayers supposedly called off the fix and resolved to play to win for the rest of the series. Over the next two games, the Sox sprang to life, winning 5-4 and 4-1 and putting themselves back in the race for the championship. Backing out of a deal with gangsters proved difficult, however, and several of the players later hinted at having received threats against their families. Whether because of intimidation or merely an unexpectedly strong opposition, the Sox went on to lose Game 8 to the Reds 10-5, giving Cincinnati their first ever World Series win. Baseball's leading figures appeared content to let the 1919 World Series go unexamined, and it largely did until August 31, 1920, when evidence surfaced that gamblers had rigged a regular season game between the Cubs and the Phillies. A grand jury convened to investigate, and speculation soon turned to the previous year's World Series. Around the same time, gambler Bill Maharg went public with an account of his own involvement in the fix. As the accusations mounted, Eddie Seacott decided to testify before the grand jury. During a tearful mea culpa, the pitcher admitted involvement in the scandal, saying, I don't know why I did it. I needed the money. I had the wife and kids. Shortly afterward, star hitter Shoeless Joe Jackson testified and admitted to having accepted $5,000 from his teammates. Over the next few days, Lefty Williams and Oscar Felsch also confessed their involvement. In October 1920, Gandil, Seacott, Williams, Reesberg, Felsch, McMullen, Weaver, and Jackson, now dubbed the Black Sox, were indicted on nine counts of conspiracy. In the Black Sox case, Defense counsel, notably Benedict Short and Henry Berger, worked tirelessly to cultivate a bond between the working class men on the jury and the blue collar defendants. While they were lambasted in the media for selling out baseball, the players coasted through their June 1921 trial after all the paper records relating to their grand jury confessions vanished under mysterious circumstances. Many now believe that Comiskey and gambling kingpin Arnold Rothstein arranged for the papers to be stolen as part of a cover-up. Whatever the cause, the prosecution's case disappeared along with the confessions. In the Black Sox case, defense counsel denounced the wealthy victim Comiskey and his corporation. The defense lawyers also raised the specter of another menace. American League president Van Johnson portrayed as a malevolent force working outside of jury view to ensure the unfair condemnation of the accused. On August 2, 1921, the Black Sox were found not guilty on all counts. Few others shared the jurors' satisfaction in their verdict, with many baseball officials vowing never to grant employment to the acquitted players. Baseball commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis had taken note of the minor league's prompt expulsion of the Pacific Coast League players who had had their own indictments dismissed by a judge in their own game-fixing case. The commissioner, who had been hired in November 1920, now utilized that action as precedent. He decreed that all eight players were permanently banned from organized baseball. Regardless of the verdict of juries, he wrote, no player who throws a ball game, no player that undertakes or promises to throw a ball game, no player that sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball. The commissioner's decision effectively destroyed the careers of the eight Black Sox. Some of them later tried to win reinstatement to the league 
but the commissioner's decision ensured that none of the disgraced baseball players ever set foot on a big league diamond again. The decision was especially harsh towards Buck Weaver, who was banned even though he supposedly dropped out of the plot before it started. Joe Jackson, meanwhile, had admitted to accepting money from the Black Sox, but later claimed that he was an unwilling participant and had tried to tip Comiskey to the scheme. Shoeless Joe's true level of involvement remains unclear, but his series best batting average of 375 suggests he might not have taken an active role in throwing the 1919 championship. Weaver applied six times for reinstatement to baseball beginning in 1922. His final petition came in 1953 when he requested reinstatement from one of Landis's successors as commissioner, Ford Frick, which was denied. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's episode. If you enjoyed it, click like, and if you watched on YouTube, hit subscribe. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all next time.